So thank you, Pastor Troy, for the great word last week about the Great Commission. I'm going to come back, put your thinking cap on if you were here two weeks ago, because I'm going to share part two of the message of how to uh, pass every test and overcome in every trial, something like that. It's a good, uh, uh, yes, how to uh, overcome every temptation and pass every test. So we're going to come back to this. And I was thinking of several years ago, you know, we, we planted the church, started with eight people, you know the story, and maybe 10 or 12 years ago, we were just, all hell was breaking loose at the church. You know, sickness, conflicts, financial pressures, I was getting with Johnny on Mondays and we were deciding which bills to pay and and leaders under attack, and, and I left that day, and I took my normal trek down 301, and I could just feel the Holy Spirit in the car, and it was one of those moments where the Holy Spirit just made it clear that there's an assignment on the church right now from the enemy, but you are going to make it through this, and you're going to pass the tests and the trials, and when you do that, Something great is on the other side of it. Can I get a witness in here? Have you been there? You have. And, and, I, and I don't know. Uh, the good news is I'm not saying this is one of those seasons. I hope it's not. Can I get an amen? But, but I do know we're off to an incredible start this year. We've had several salvations. Still hearing documented miracles coming in from three days ablaze. I was with Pastor Josh from the Wilson campus. They had a mom over there, could not leave the house. She was so sick. She had had a baby, her blood pressure. She hadn't left her house. She came to Three Days of Blaze and came through this prayer line. And when she came up to Pastor Chavez, he said, I had a vision of you going through this prayer line and God healing you. And she has not missed a Sunday since that night. God healed her. And and there's more and more stories coming in like that. And, and, And so... God is moving, and oftentimes, let's, let's keep it real today, with that comes trials. With that comes tests from God to see if we're ready to be promoted into those places. And in those times, one thing I've learned after going through a lot of that, like we all do, I'm not trying to say I'm a martyr up here, everybody's going to relate to what I'm talking about this morning Here's, here's a little tweak I've made that's helped me. I'm going to be aware of the devil because the Bible says to be alert, but I'm not going to focus on the devil. Um, if I'll stay in tune with God and what he's doing and what he's trying to build in me and what he's calling me to, more than anything else, you will be unstoppable. If you'll focus on that. Now, how do you do that? How do you e- overcome every temptation and pass every test? Well, part one we talked about how to overcome temptations. And we made some statements that are worth repeating. I'm not going to spend long on this, but maybe you weren't here two weeks ago. Let me repeat a couple of things. First of all, the definition of temptation is this. Anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. Anything that promises to satisfy you, your flesh, your appetite, whatever, But you know deep in your gut, if I do this, I'm going to be disobeying God. That is what temptation is. How about this one? You are never, ever above temptation. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care how many Bible studies you've taken. I don't care if we pray an hour a day. Temptation is all around us out in this world. And if we start thinking we're above temptation, it often leads to careless living and exposing yourself unnecessarily to harmful things because you think you're invincible. How about this one? I learned this little reverse psychology on the devil. Every temptation is an invitation to depend on God. Every time the devil tries to tempt me, every time like James said, I'm dragged up, trying to be dragged away by my own weaknesses, the Bible says, and enticed, I want to treat that, okay, this is just another reason to lean back into God and depend on him. And how about this? There's always a way of escape when you're being tempted. That's one of the greatest promises in all the Bible. 
1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation is overtaking me except which is common to all people, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, for when you're tempted, he will provide a way out. Not like this, so you can endure it. In other words, you reach that breaking point, cry out to God and say, God, I need an escape. And he will give it to you out of that temptation. And a couple more, why resist tomorrow which you can eliminate today when it comes to temptation? Most sins are sins of opportunity. And so it's, if we're, let me say this, if your life is just filled with temptation, man, everywhere I go I'm being tempted, then you have some holes in your life that need to be filled. Because your life should not be filled with constant temptation. Yes, we have to live in a world that is filled with temptation, but we have the ability, if we live with the wisdom of God, to eliminate so many of those things. Well, they can't get to me. Because I'm living with the wisdom of God. And I talked about my little story about my firewalls. Remember that? And how I used to sell masonry products. And these schools, especially those gatherings of large groups of people, a school, a concert hall, whatever it is, they will build walls and they have fire ratings. And it can be a one hour or a two hour. And that tells me it will take two hours for a fire to burn through this wall. And you know what? That is to, to give me time to escape, <laughs> to give me time to get out of the building. And some of you, I said, man, you got a problem. Your fire ratings on your spiritual walls are about 60 seconds. Can I get a witness in here? You got temptation all around you. You need to take inventory and get those firewalls up where they need to be. You need to eliminate some relationships. You need to look at, look at your phone, look at what you're watching on TV, look at who you're hanging out with, all these things that can just be this constant open door to temptation. And then the last thing was we looked at James 4, 7, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will, everybody say will, not might, he will flee from you. And we gave three steps to victory. Submit to God. That's first. Resist the devil. And we do that in so many ways, guys. Your words, your prayers, your relationships. And I'll say it again. You can resist the devil and not focus your life on the devil. Resist means you're active against his attacks. And you use your weapons. Live by the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. That means always keep moving forward with God, with people that are moving forward like you. Can I get an amen? Man, that was worth coming just to hear that. That was awesome. Now, we're going to get into the new stuff. Take your Bible and turn to James chapter 1, and that's going to be our launching place as we talk about this second part and how to overcome the trials of life. James chapter 1, and we'll read verses 1 through 5. It says, James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations... Greetings. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now let perseverance finish its work, James says, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Hallelujah. James refers to himself as a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's pretty cool because this isn't James of Peter, James, and John. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. That would be a tough assignment. Can I get an amen to be Jesus' brother? Talk about never measuring up (laughs) to someone who's, who's the brother. But he doesn't play the nepotism card. He just says, I'm a servant of God just like everybody else. And he's writing to the other servants of Jesus in this case. Uh, in Jerusalem, all over Asia Minor, and he does not beat around the bush, no warm-up, no anesthesia. That's the thing that James is good at. He gets right to the issue. Count it all joy, brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. That line alone will get our attention. You know, I think one of the reasons it seems so far-fetched is that when he says joy, our minds immediately jump to happiness. And the longer I live, the more I learn that joy has nothing to do with happiness. I get happy when I eat at Bojangles. Can I get an amen? 
or Chick-fil-A. I get happy when I see my dog when I get home, and I get happy when I watch a movie. And there's nothing wrong with being happy. I want a lot of happy moments. But joy is, joy is supernatural. Happiness is just a surface emotion that goes up and down throughout my day. Joy is totally different. You have to understand, James is talking about something supernatural, not of this world. That's why he can put joy and trials in the same sentence. But that's not the full story. Joy is supernatural, I believe, delight in the person of God. Even when I don't understand the trials, I live with a supernatural delight in the person of God, the purposes of God, and don't forget this one, the people of God. I hope one of the things you love about coming to church is you get fired up to see the people of God because you got some good brothers and some good sisters in this house. You ever met a stranger in an airport, in a restaurant, and something goes off in your heart, you immediately know they're a follower of Jesus. That's a beautiful thing. That's where joy comes from. He says, count it all joy, brothers, when you face, and some translations say, meet trials of many kinds. So that's going to set the tone right there. When you face a trial, you face it down, you don't try to run away, you don't try to uh, skip out, you face it, you meet it head on. And you face that trial, some translations say when you fall into trials. You know, and how many of you know your life can turn on a dime? Everything looks great and all of a sudden you fall, it's like you're riding down the road and you hit a pothole. And all of a sudden, everything just crashes. So, so let's think about this. The phrase says, count it. It literally means to press your mind upon it, to weigh it. So to do that, we have to ask ourselves some questions. Now, I told the first service, I've read a few articles recently about people that are successful. And I don't have all the traits, but I do have two. I like to be alone and I talk to myself <laughs> a lot. Now, thus far, I've never answered myself. And if I do, I'll get some counseling. But I like to process verbally, right? So oftentimes, if I'm walking my dog, I'm talking to myself because there's a lot going on in my life. And so I have learned when I get hit with many trials, and you know what I'm talking about, sometimes there's three or four things you're dealing with that are hard. All at the same time, I've learned to ask myself questions. So what I'm going to tell you is we're going to go small, and then we're going to go big. The first question is, what is happening to me right now? What is going on? Because sometimes you, you're making up the future, right? Right? You're going through the trial, but you're jumping three steps ahead and getting stressed out. That's not the trial. God can change that if he wants to. What is going on right now? Let me get my arms around. Then secondly, I back up and say, why am I here on this earth? Why am I here? And that brings perspective. Then I bring two together and say, how can what is happening to me advance the purpose of why I'm here? How can those two come together? Well, we are here to present a contrast of life with Jesus versus, <coughs> excuse me, life without Jesus. And to be God's ambassadors of reconciliation. Can I get an amen? That's what we all have in common. So next he says, to know that the testing of your faith. So here we go. Everything in life is a battle of believing. That's what it is. Am I going to keep believing God until this comes to pass? And me and Daryl put up those blinds in that kid's building yesterday. We thought we were going to heaven. I mean, it was so hard, the steel, and we kept, we, they were kind of coming in. They thought we were in there eating donuts. We put two blinds up in two hours. Guys, the walls are too thick. And I left, and Daryl said, you know, I solved it. I just had to stand there, Pastor, with that drill and not move until that hole got opened. <laughs> And I just had to stand there and keep on and keep on in faith, and eventually it would go through. Am I talking to anybody? Every trial is a test. It's a battle of believing. So you may say, everything at my house is great right now. No problems. We haven't had any problems for years. 
Well, that actually may be bad news for you. (laughs) Because the Bible says God chastens and disciplines those he loves. The Bible, James just wrote this to the church and said, you're going to face many trials at times all at once. You may want to make sure you're a son and daughter of God. Or you want to make sure you're doing something in faith. Because sometimes we build a life that's so safe we don't have any trials. And that's not inspiring to God either. If you're out there making a difference in the world, you're going to go through some stuff. So when these tests and trials come, here's another question to ask. Do I really believe that God is in control of my life? Or is that just lip service? That's just something I say. Do I really believe in this moment with these things going on circumstantially, do I still believe he's in control? Do I still believe he wants to bring good things forth for me? I may say, yes, I believe that. I want to believe that, but we are not seeing any evidence of that at my house right now. The money is struggling. The relationships are struggling. But I believe that God is good and he wants to do good things for me. And I just have to wait and let the process play out. The question becomes, are we willing to wait in faith until we see it? Are we willing to stand in a hard place when you know what God has best things in mind for you? Willing to not get in and manipulate, am I talking to anybody, try to fix it yourself. Try to find a shortcut for our lack of patience. I've been waiting long enough. I'm ready to deal with this. I'm going to deal with it myself. I'm going to fix it myself. Will we find that is not a great place to be very quickly? Can I get an amen? Between you and blocking the work of God, I think Paul called it kicking against the goads. The Bible says, do not fret. It leads only to evil. And you fret. Now, at this point, you may be saying, where's the joy part? (laughs) Well, there's another component again. It says the testing of your faith produces perseverance, steadfastness, patience, some translations say. And in the Greek, it means to remain under, to not run, to stay in your trial, to fight, to fight, to remain under God's process. That's why asking the right questions is so important for me because it calms me. It gives me perspective and what you're walking through and keeps me under and in the process of God when I don't want to stay, when I feel like everything is going wrong. Now, I get sometimes in our own rebellion we can create it, but I'm talking about when you're doing all you know to do and things are still going wrong. There's still trials, and it's not just one, it's two, three, four. Everything happening at once. That's why asking those questions, think about it. What is the first thing we usually do when we find ourselves in a trial? We want to look for an exit ramp. We want to get out of it. We want to go find a different spouse. Go find a different ministry. This one's frustrating me. Go find a different church. Go find a different job. How about this one? Go find a different set of kids. Can I get a witness in here? (laughs) That's probably extreme, but maybe some of you some of you said that on the way to church this morning. Come on. Uh, We do not want to remain under in our flesh. We want to run away. If that is not an option, we want to lash out verbally to others, our circumstance. We want to throw a pity party, and we say it all the time. The problem with a pity party is the devil brings the balloons and the whistles. Can I get an amen? When you throw yourself a pity party. With actions, we want to retaliate. Depending on the way we're wired, we may want to lash out, or we may just want to lay down and give up. But giving up or running away or lashing out is not what the Scripture just told us to do. James says, remain under. Let the trial have its full effect in you because something is happening in your gut that you can't accomplish any other way. If you cut and run, you're going to be right back here again six months from now. Stay under the process of God. Or what do I get for that? God, you know what? You get something money can't buy. You get maturity. You get completeness. James is so bold to say, if you'll stay in this, if you don't cut and run, if you'll just stay under what God has you in, you will be lacking nothing. The King James says you'll be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Wow. So put that together. Remaining under is the whole point. It's the whole point of the trial. 
These trials teach us to stop lashing out, to stop running finally, to stop quitting and remain under God, to keep walking with him no matter what until I pass the test. And when I read this chapter, my spirit always goes to John 15 where Jesus brings the same theological truth with different language. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and apart from me you can do nothing. If you cut me off right now, will you actually need me the most? If you cut and run, you will wither and die. But if you remain in me, you will look, think about this. This will make you shout. Jesus says you'll get so mature. Your flesh will be so struck down and your spirit so strong. I'll look at you and say, ask me for anything and I'll give it to you. What a promise. What a promise. But he says remain in that chapter 15. I bet he says remain 10 times. It's about remaining. Everybody say remain. You got to remain in what God's doing in your life today until it finishes what it's accomplishing. So we go back to James, those who have been through tests and trials that when you finally figure out, the key is just remaining under, no matter how long it takes to come full circle. You understand then what joy is. You reach a place where, man, I don't feel like I'm lacking anything even in these difficult times. So you know what James says now is your greatest request. God, just give me wisdom. If you'll just give me wisdom, I can overcome what I'm facing. Now, lots of tests and trials, again, I'm going to say it again, comes down to this. It's a test of faith. Life is a battle of believing in God, who he says he is, what his word says. The tests and trials, no matter what they deal with, that lady who came to the revival was in a battle of believing, like the woman with the issue of blood. She said, I'm not going to stay home tonight. I'm going to go out in faith. I'm going to remain in this process. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to sit here and whine and say I can barely stand up. She made it to her miracle. Somebody shout hallelujah to that. So the tests and trials, no matter what they are, they are meant to produce in us perseverance, steadfastness, which we know means to stay under God. Stay under his word. It's the only thing that will last. Stay in his love, his guidance. No matter what life throws at you, to resist the temptation to exit, give up, or lash out. Now, the second half of this message is shorter, amen, <laughs> but it's important. I'm going to just give you three types of tests that I think everybody will go through sometimes. Let's think application for just a minute. And the first test is called the love test. Now, if you're not going to marriage builders, Ronnie and Angie are leading this ministry with a team. It is phenomenal. And Lisa and I go, and we don't do a thing. We just go there and eat for free because we're the pastors. And, and, then we, and then we sit there, and it helps us. We've been married be 33 years this November. And we, um, we want to have a great marriage. And so we've learned one night. But one thing they did this week, the video said, take the love chapter and insert your name in there and just see if it fits. Are you long-suffering? Are you not keeping a record of wrongs? And it was very convicting as we did that. 1 Corinthians, a love chapter, is one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible. Think about it. There's only two books of the Bible, two things that two entire books of the Bible are dedicated to. One is faith, Hebrews 11, and the other is love. An entire chapter of those two things. It's the most po poetic, I almost said pathetic, poetic <laughs> chapter in the Bible. So here comes the test. We know that loving people comes with a very real and profound set of risk that will lead to many tests and many trials throughout life. Because in life, sometimes the people you love the most will hurt you the deepest. Because when you love deeply, you're more vulnerable. I mean, some people wake up every morning, I'm convinced, they brush their teeth and then they sharpen their tongue. Can I get an amen in here? They go out and cut people. <laughs> and sometimes we almost all have someone in our life that we love that can do that. Somewhere along the way in life, you will go through the love test. You will become deeply wounded by someone you love. Someone you love is going to betray you. 
And you will be tempted to do exactly what we just learned not to do in James chapter 1. You'll be tempted to lash out, tempted to give up, and tempted to run away. This happens many times in the scriptures. I want you to think of Joseph standing in front of a gigantic barn about the size of this room. And he's standing there and the barn is filled with grain. And the whole world is starving to death. Because there's been a seven year famine that he prophesied. But because of the wisdom of the king to trust him, they have food. And Joseph is standing in front of that barn with the keys. And here they come. Think about it. Here comes the baker who left him rotting in prison when he helped him out. Here comes the cupbearer who left him in prison and left him. Here comes Potiphar's wife who accused him of rape falsely. He holds those keys in his hand. And then a long way off, here comes a group of guys. And there are his brothers who betrayed him, left him in a pit to die. And he has the power to make them suffer for their betrayal. But you know what? Joseph passed the love test. He didn't punish them. He showed them mercy. Because he understood something. If I lose the love test, my life is over. I can't preach anymore. You can't parent anymore the way you're supposed to. Because the Bible says in the love chapter that I can give everything I possess to the poor. I can surrender my body to the flames. But if I don't have love, I am nothing. If I don't resist when people hurt me, becoming bitter and lashing out, and there are so many people in this world by the thousands who are bitter, and they can recall in detail something someone did to them 20 years ago. They've never let it go, and it's changed the core of who they are. So Joseph stood there, and he showed mercy because he guarded his heart in that moment. I want you to think for a minute about King David. He went through a lot as well. And think about what he went through while I find my place in my notes. Again, David had a family that betrayed him on so many levels. You know, he had a father who betrayed him and said, I will not show you unconditional love. He had a wife who turned on him. He had all these people. He had a son who abandoned him. He had all these people that turned their back against him. He had a father-in-law who tried to kill him. He had Absalom who broke his heart. And you thought your family was messed up, right? But he refused to become bitter. He refused, and that's why he could still worship after all that time. You see, when people do horrible things to us, you have to remember two things. They did it to Jesus, and he said they're going to do it to you. Did he not warn us? And you know what? The second thing I've learned to remember, this is a test. It's a test. And if I fail this one, it's game over. I cannot fail this test. I cannot let my heart become hard towards people around me. I have to remain under God. Think about it, guys. Job lost 10 children in one day. He had a wife who said, just go kill yourself. He had four friends who sat around in a circle and mocked him and attacked him verbally, called him a hypocrite and a liar, and that all the trials and tests were just God's judgment on you. But the Bible says he passed the test. First of all, if he hadn't gone through that, we'd have never heard of the man. Can I get an amen? And then if he hadn't passed the love test, we wouldn't have heard his testimony where he said, I didn't become bitter. I prayed for those people and God gave me double for my trouble. Can I get an amen? Unconditional love, praise God, does not mean unconditional acceptance of behavior. That's one of Satan's lies. That to show love, I have to accept whatever people do. I've seen wives stay in marriages when they're being physically beaten because they think that's how they show love. 
You know, I've seen parents just let kids do whatever they want to do and even support it just because they think that's what love is. That's not what love is. Love is maintaining a standard, but there are ways to do that, even if it's separation, and still express the love of God and the mercy of God. You can find ways to tell someone you love them. And the Bible promises me love never fails. When we soon realize that the most tests are simply a microcosm of the real test, what is the real test? I'm going to keep going. Remain in Christ. Remain under God. Remain in the vine. Whatever you're going through, you will have the victory if you don't come out from under God. If you stay under his hand, stay in his process. And when you come out, you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I'm going to give you two more little short ones. How about the test of money and possessions? After Troy just said we never pressure to give money, I'm going to talk about money. But I'm not going to pressure you. The Bible is so clear My money and my possessions belong to God. And we are called to live a life of generosity. The Bible gives me a template, give 10% back to all of him. He says, live generously. How many of you, um, I've had to turn in my heart to a better place. I I, I bet a lot of you, if I ask you to lift your hands, are tired now of going everywhere and everywhere you go, it asks you, do you want to leave a tip? (laughs) Stuff that you would never think about leaving a tip. I made a decision several months back. I'm just going to embrace it. I'll leave a tip everywhere I go. It might be 50 cent, but I'm going to leave them something. Because I want to live a life of generosity. And it's just a chance for me to keep in that mindset. I'm going to live generously. That keeps me from becoming angry and resentful about it. And so some are struggling right now living outside of that principle. And we've become convinced we can go further on our own. And you know what happens? The money gets tight and the unexpected bills come. And I'm telling you, I've learned this. It's a test. Will I continue to live a life of generosity? God forbid that I cut him off in the time I need him the most. Will you stay under God's principle of giving? Will you continue to live a life of generosity like the church in Thessalonians, even when it's hard? And I'm going to ask the worship team to come back as I give you one more and this is just one that as a pastor I'm very passionate about the test of the Sabbath you know there's a list in the Bible called the Ten Commandments anybody ever heard of it (laughs) hey there's a great show coming out about it a few weeks ago it'll be on ABC it's called the Ten Commandments Charlton Heston one of the greatest shows ever made and you know what that list is a timeless list of things that God declared in the earth and he said if you'll honor these 10 things it will go a long ways for you walking in the protection of your creator there's things on that list it's serious stuff like murder lying adultery false gods honor your father and mother and on that same list is i command you to honor the sabbath on that list God has commanded his people to take a Sabbath day. And it goes all the way back to the beginning of time. But in America, in our human pride, sometimes we're convinced ourselves, I don't need a Sabbath day. And I'm so excited that the room is full this morning, that we have, but you know, in America, only 1.5 Sundays a month is average church attendance. Because I think people are convinced they don't need a Sabbath anymore. We're better off just entertaining ourselves, or we're so important that we can't even stop for one day. If I stop for one day, the whole world's going to stop. And that is pride in us. Just convincing ourselves, some of you need to rest. You need to stop one day a week. And the Sabbath, guys, is for physical rest and spiritual revitalization. And I want you to do that. I want you to commit. Are you failing that test today? Now, I get Probably if you're here, I might be preaching to the wrong crowd. So when you leave, call somebody who's not here. No, I'm just kidding. Well, maybe you can. Say, hey, pastor was preaching to you today. Where were you? (laughs) Are you working on that garage still? Are you down at that lake house again? (laughs) Whatever you can tell them to awaken them. I believe so strong in this, guys. And you know what? It's a daily Sabbath. I promise you, if you will take 20 minutes a day, and spend alone with God 30 minutes a day, you'll get more done 
than if you didn't spend that time in the same amount of time. Because God will give you wisdom. He will give you strength. He will give you protection. I learned it long ago. And the first thing I said, my wife and I, when we get up, she goes to her chair and I go to my chair because she's not my source. God is my source. I'm not her source. God is her source. Above all, everything else, and we seek the Lord for that day, for his grace and his protection. I'm talking to some people. You're failing the Sabbath test. I believe you're going to walk out of here in victory this morning. Somebody shout amen. Hey, let's change this thing today. Would you go ahead and stand to your feet? I'm excited about just taking this challenge by persevering and praying. Man, it's time to get to a place where we can overcome every temptation and pass every test. If you're ready to do that, shout hallelujah. We'll build our firewalls, eliminate today what can tempt you tomorrow. I'm going to pray, and I believe some people here today, you're walking through some stuff, and you need to remain under, and you're about to cut and run. I want you to come to this altar while we're worshiping. These altars were filled in the 9 o'clock service, and there's twice as many people here. And I know there's some people, you just need to make that statement. We open up the altars because sometimes in your physical body, you need to express what's happening in your spirit it's good for you so let's open up these altars i'm going to pray father in the name of jesus christ we thank you that you want us to remain in the process this morning god you want us to rebuild our firewalls where we god give us the courage to eliminate today what we know we leave hanging around that will tempt us a week from now and we do it intentionally in moments of weakness but today is the day of deliverance And we just thank you for that. And Father, I pray for those of us who are in that time where all, anybody doing anything for you, God, is going through this from time to time. They are facing many trials. Not just one trial, but two, three, four battles that they're fighting all at one time. And today, they're going to make a decision. I'm not going to come out from under it. I'm going to stay in the vine. I'm going to stay in the process. And when I come out on the other side, glory to God, I'm going to be victorious. I'm going to be mature and complete. So God, as we end with this holy moment of worship, I pray you do that. I want to give one more invitation. Are you here today and you've never met Jesus Christ as your Savior? Last week, we had people born again in this service. We had people born again in the prison ministry campus. We had people born again in the other campuses. God is bringing people back to Him. And I want to give you that opportunity to say, I need to recommit my life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've known Him years ago and you've walked away. If that's you, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that He is Lord, you shall be saved. I want to tell you, I'll be down here, Pastor Troy, Pastor Jason, whoever you want. I want you to come to this altar. Just let us pray a simple prayer with you. And if you're there, ask your neighbor, do you need me to go down with you? Sometimes that's what they need. So if you need to meet Jesus, come on, lift your hand if you need to meet Jesus. And then when we begin to sing, I want you to come. Holy Spirit, do your work right now. Can we give God about 10 seconds of praise in here? Come on. I feel the Holy Spirit. Come to this altar right now. If you need to remain under God in a trial you're walking through, come right now.